Have you ever wondered how an atheist can learn to trust God? That's what we'll talk about today. If you seek God, you will see him. If you do not seek God, you will still see him. T.A. Klein. Today, I thought I would tell you the story of how I became a Christian. Hopefully, you've gotten a chance to know me a little bit through this podcast and learn to know a little bit about how I think and how I act. The truth is, is that I spent the first 22 years of my life as an atheist. I didn't believe in God, but I wasn't one of those atheists who didn't like people who believed in God. I thought, you know, if that's the thing that you need, that's the way that you need to think of things, that's cool for you. I don't. You do you, I'll do me, and that's fine. And that story changed quite a bit um, when I went to college. I always get this opportunity every couple of years to go to a Christian college in Minnesota and tell a little bit about my story about how I became a Christian. The title of the speech originally was From the Outside Looking In. Because I wasn't a Christian, I was friends with a number of people who were Christian. Some were Christian in name only, some were actually Christians. And what's amazing is now that I've had a chance to see some of the people online have become better Christians, stronger Christians since I left them in the past. I grew up as an atheist. My dad was an atheist. He didn't believe in God and he didn't believe in anyone believing in God. He came from a small town in Ohio where everyone went to this one church. And to get anywhere in life, he said, you had to be a member of this church. And so that left him very resentful that religion was just this tool that is used to control people and a way of virtue signaling so that the people in the town do nice things for you. And it's not really how faith was ever meant to be, but he got a very bad impression of it and he hated all faith. My mom grew up Jewish. Um, She was adopted and her family was very Jewish, but not so much in a religious way, but more of a cultural way. They went to temple and I went to temple with my grandmother and with other members of the family. But to them, it was about being a community, being together in Judaism and believing in it. They did the Sabbath dinners. They did the lights, the Hanukkah lights. They did all of the things. But I never really got the opinion that my grandmother believed in God, or if she did, it wasn't so much the God of the Torah. It was more about, again, being part of that community. So when I grew up, it was commanded that I be Jewish. And so I went through the whole process. What was funny is I grew up in this very northern town. It was a military base. And it had two churches on it. One was Catholic, one was Protestant. And I don't recall that there were any other Jewish people on the base, but I'm sure there were. But we had to requisition a rabbi from the military so that I could have a bat mitzvah. There was a temple in a town that was about 30 miles away from where I lived. And my parents, because of my grandmother's wishes, brought me to the temple For Saturday school, I know a lot of people go to Sunday school. I went to Saturday school and I liked it because the place where the temple was was in this beautiful hiking land. And so after Saturday school, me and all the people who were there would all go hiking. And so I really loved it. But it was interesting to have the education of Saturday school to learn about the holidays and about God of the Bible The community was a very strong Jewish community and actually pretty religious when I remember the people that were in it. So I got to learn a lot about it. A lot of people on the military base tried to witness to me, (laughs) probably because I was one of the rare Jewish people that were there. I got a chance, you know, in school usually to talk about what it is to be Jewish and what it means because not a lot of people really knew much about it, but I was able to present for that. But I had this family, my best friend, and her family was kind of um, interesting. I think they went to almost like a a cult-like church, but it was in the middle of woods. It had this one centralized leader, and he was kind of uh, an interesting uh, character. But the mother in that family always tried to evangelize to me, almost in the worst possible way. So I'm this little kid, right? And we would watch 
the movie The Omen. And she would say, you know, that's going to happen to you. You're going to get a 666 on your forehead because you don't believe in Jesus. And I'd be like, what? And then we would watch a vampire movie the next weekend. And she would say, well, you know, you don't have any natural resistance to vampires. Because if you hold up a cross or splash him with holy water, it's not going to work for you because you don't believe in Jesus. And I'd be like, what? So here I was, this poor kid, thinking that I was going to turn out to be a devil or a vampire was going to get me. So that was probably the worst form of evangelism possible. Later, you know, in high school, I had good friends who were Christians. I'd go to church with them because we would have to go to church because their parents expected them to go to church. So I'd go with them and then we'd go to the movies afterwards. And so I was pretty well versed in the church and I loved reading about it. I was interested almost in every religion. I was almost reading books about every religion as if I were shopping for a new car. You know, it didn't mean anything to me. And in fact, if you ask me what religion I would become back then, I would like to become the Greek religion because I thought there were some amazing stories in Greek mythology. I wasn't going to believe it. I wasn't going to believe any religion. But, you know, I thought that was super cool. Then came the time when I went to college. And when I went to college, I had people on my dorm floor who would tell me about Jesus. And, you know, and I always had this question. I think most atheists have a question that when a Christian or someone religious is bothering them too much, you're going to drop this question down and it's going to stop the conversation because I'm just tired of talking about this. And so I always asked people, because, again, I was pretty well-versed in the Bible and what it said in the Bible. I would ask people, well, do you think I'm going to hell because I don't believe in God? No, no, we don't really know what happens. We don't really know. And so people wouldn't say that. And then I would challenge them. Well, that's not what your Bible says. That's not what this verse and that verse. And I was able to quote to them all the places in the Bible where it says that's true. It, oh, well, you know, and people would back away from it and then they would get uncomfortable and we would go talk about something else instead. Then came my college roommate and we were roommates for a long time, for a couple of years, but she's a pretty big introvert. She didn't like talking about some things much at all. And at some point we started talking about God and religion. And of course, I got kind of sick of the conversation at some point, And I said to her, well, do you think I'm going to hell? And what she said was, yes, and my family prays for you. And it was stunning. My best friend thinks I'm going to hell. My family is praying about me. And so at that moment where you feel like you could be very mad about it, suddenly you're not mad at all. It's hard to be mad when people are telling you that they're praying for you, even if it's something that you don't believe in at all. And it's always interesting to me when people get mad about that statement. Look, if I met someone at another religion and I said, well, do you think I'm going to your version of hell? And they said, yes, it wouldn't bug me because I don't believe in that religion. So why in the world would it bug you? In a sense, I was bugged by this, but why? But in the other sense, I was charmed by this because they were praying for me. And that really started our conversations about God, the Bible, and what it is she really does believe. Because in the end, she was the first Christian I met who stood up for faith and didn't try to couch it into some kind of a nice way, but she said the thing I knew her faith believed in. The interesting thing about her is, is at first we are still friends. We are neighbors. We live very close to each other. And we hang out so much. I see her so many times a week. The thing that you have to realize about my friend and I have known her now for so many years, is that she's a very big introvert. She's the most unlikely person that I would imagine would talk to me about God and say hard things. But I'm eternally grateful she did, and she brought me to God. And I think if anyone has worries or concerns that you could not talk to people about God, you should realize It happens in the most unlikeliest corners. And of course you can, no matter how introverted or shy or just not wanting to break up a really good friendship, you can do it too. We'll talk in future episodes about evangelism and how to talk to people about God. But like I said, my best friend, she's the most unlikely evangelist. And 
because of this conversation and what she talked about to me, I ended up asking her a ton of questions, real questions this time, not just me trying to get her to shut up, but I really wanted to know things. And she said, you have reached what I'm able to answer for you. Let me introduce you to my pastor and he will be able to answer questions for you. And I had a lot. I mean, at this point, I'm 21 years old. I have a whole life of atheism, my dad's voice, all the things he said about faith and religion, all the things I learned. You know, I was an astrophysics major. I was going to be an astronomer at this point. And so I also like science. I don't want to become a Christian because I like science. I still like science. I am still really into science. I am thinking about starting a science podcast. That doesn't matter to whether or not I have faith and who I believe is God of everything. So he has a class, and at that time there was no other people. So it was just me and my best friend. And it was supposed to be four one-hour sessions. I think it lasted like 16 weeks and were like four hours per session. I'm sorry to his wife. I probably kept him at the church so late. <laughs> then he probably needed to get home. But he answered so many questions for me. He got to everything. He had this amazing ability. And I think it's because it's a town that's not particularly good with faith. He was prepared. He had the armor on to talk about God in a hostile environment. And so he was able to answer my questions. And he was so good. It was um, sad. He died a couple of years ago, and he just meant everything to me because of all the teaching that he did to me and taught me how God loves me and how even these questions I have doesn't change the fact that God still loves me. So later that year, I was baptized, and my best friend was my godmother, and we still go to that church today. And now I've been a Christian longer <laughs> than I spent my life not being a Christian. And so it's a, such an important thing to me because I remember, and that's why I do this presentation, what it is like not to be a Christian and what it's like to be a Christian now. The funny thing about it is, you know, I wasn't a partier. I wasn't doing wild things. I wasn't really doing anything that you would recognize as being bad. And that's where you have to realize that even if you're not doing the outlandish, visible sins, you're still sinning. And that faith in God is important. Forgiveness from God is important, even if you're not obviously someone who is doing things like robbing banks and murdering people, right? It still matters, and we still need God in our lives. Eventually, the sad story is, is that um, my dad, who was the atheist, he always raised me, you know, when we were going to temple and they were taking me to Saturday school. He was not particularly happy with it. And he hoped in the end that I'd be an atheist just like he was. So he always said to me, look, I know we're taking you to temple, but please understand you can be anything you want to be. Don't make this a final decision for yourself. So the two of us went to lunch one day and I said, you remember how you always said I don't have to be Jewish? that the choice is always mine and I can be anything I want to be. He's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Well, I wanted to let you know I am now a Christian and a believer in Jesus. And you could tell it depressed him. He let out a big sigh, disappointment, and he said, well, just don't let it change your life. What a statement that is. How can you see a God who loves you, who has your back, who wants you in heaven and not let that change you. It was something that was stunning to me. And it also turned out it was the last time I ever talked to him. He never spoke to me again. And that was the end of our relationship. And then, you know, decades later when he died, he never said a thing to me and our relationship was over. So it was a major thing. My relationship with my mother never changed and I was happy for that. But certainly it ended it with my father, which was sad for me because I liked my father. I mean, he was a terrible drunk and he did horrible things to our family. But at the times when he was sober, he was an interesting person to talk to. So it was very painful for me. And the funny thing about it is 
I became a Christian when I was almost at the happiest point in my life. I was just in college. I was living on my own. College was going very well. I was meeting friends and making a life for myself. And that's when I became a Christian. And it upset things a bit. You know, with my family, I didn't know if they were going to speak to me anymore. I didn't know what was going to happen there. It caused turmoil because then suddenly when you believe in X and suddenly now you believe in Y, your whole life goals change. What you want in life changes and how you see the world changes. And so it took something that was very happy for me and almost upset the whole cart. Suddenly I was seeing my life in turmoil now. And I think it was important for me to become a Christian when things were going very well for me, because if I had done it when I was very emotional, if I had done it when I was having great stress and I came to Jesus because something devastating happened to me, I wonder if I would have trusted it because I would have thought in my sort of super logical mind, oh, well, you just believed in Jesus because you were hurting. You needed someone to lean on. It was just a thing that happened to you. And because it didn't happen that way, I had no explanation for it. I had no way to say, well, it only happened because I was upset. So I believe that God spoke to me at a time that would bring lasting results and not just a temporary, hmm, I just wonder if this is just a temporary phase I'm going through. Now it's been a number of years and having this podcast, I wanted to do something that could talk about faith issues, even strengthen my own faith. I joked in the other podcast that if you want to learn more about something, start a podcast. You will learn all about it because you have to learn something enough to explain it to other people. I used to read books and things all the time. And then it would just evaporate out of my head. I wouldn't remember the book anymore. It wouldn't matter. And I just kind of plowed through books one after another. But now with having the other podcast, Start With Small Steps, and this podcast, I'm actually having to learn things and explain it to other people, which also means that this podcast, while I hope it's helping you in your Christian walk, it's helping me in my Christian walk. I'm still learning and I'm still trying to find my own path when it comes to walking the ways with God. Over the years, you know, when I first became a Christian, it was hard at first because I would see people sinning in the church. And I was fresh and I was new and I was a brand new Christian and brand new baptized. And to see people sinning in the church was probably my first hurdle. How can they possibly sin? They know their whole lives that God is there for them. And then you realize, oh, I am still sinning too. Becoming a Christian, being a Christian is not about turning you into perfection. One perfect human being on this earth, and that was Jesus. And that's it. The question is, is forgiveness from God and trying to walk in that way because your life will go better if you walk in the ways of God. The fruit of faith is action. And so I try to do better in that too. My next experience with the church itself was, you know, what happens then? You're all ready. You're feeling very faithful. You're feeling very strong. And then suddenly, maybe one week, you don't feel that strong. You don't feel that in love. You feel more distance from God. You realize, as I mentioned in the Screwtape Letters podcast in the last episode, that it is not about emotion. It is not about love in this American, ooh, we're in love kind of way. It is in good times and in bad. I mean, even the wedding vows that people take in sickness and in health, in good times and bad, in richness and in poverty, that is when we love God too. The marriage is often talked about as an analogy for our faith in God. And so even when you're riding this high and you're believing in God and you're brand new to the faith and you just got baptized and everything's going your way, those times in the wilderness still are meant for you to have faith, even if you're just not feeling it 
right at that moment. So that was probably the second experience that came to mind when I became a Christian. And now where I'm at is in this phase, as I mentioned, of wanting to know more, learn more. This is the most important aspect in my life. This is the most important thing to me, is being close to God. And looking at the church and looking at you know how children get educated, you realize that there's Saturday school, there's Sunday school, but when children are educated in the faith, how do you turn that into an adult faith, a grown-up faith? You know, these picture books of everything in the Bible are about children, you know, and introducing these concepts to children. But what do we do when we sit there and say, oh, well, the Bible is this, or the Bible is that, or God never intended this or intended that. And it made me realize that when I look in the world around me, a lot of people had education in the church and with faith and in the Bible only when they were young and they never had the chance to get an adult education in faith. Because this is where it suddenly matters when it comes to issues of marriage, when it comes to issues of death, when it comes to issues of pandemic, or when it comes to issues of how do you treat your neighbor? How do you treat the other people around you? How do you treat the other people in your church with you? And that's what I'm hoping this podcast is, is giving us a chance to get that education in becoming an adult in the church, having a grown-up faith and having a grown-up understanding of what God says in the Bible. So my road, my path from being an atheist, having an atheist father who I identified with quite a bit, and becoming a Christian eventually, and now where I'm at now, is a journey for me, just like it's a journey for you. And I'm so glad that you're on this journey with me. I'm hoping together that we can really tie ourselves to God and to his mission for us in his life. And that I hope, too, that someday when we get to heaven, I'll get a chance to meet you all. I don't really know who you are right now, but someday, hopefully, that will happen. So my challenge to you is think about the earliest time you remember thinking about the issues of God. Perhaps you were raised in the church and it was always a part of your life, but at what point did you start thinking about it as compared to your parents and the church telling you about it, when do you think you started gaining your own faith in God? And think about the place that you're at now. Are you dry in the church? Are you feeling like you're not progressing forward? Or are you feeling like you're in a good spot and now is your chance to learn more and act more to making us those fellow children, disciples of God? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Again, if you could please tell a friend about this podcast, it would mean a lot to me. I'm trying to get it off the ground, and I'm hoping that it helps people, and that I'm hoping more people can get helped by this podcast. But I appreciate anything that you can do, whether it's writing a review or just sending me an email. I'd love to hear from you. But thanks so much for being out there. I appreciate the heck out of you. And remember that our steps from wherever we were as children to where we are now can be improved by taking small steps. <laughs>